fantastic. So on one side, you've got the passage, and on the other side, you've got a few notes. So you can see I've called the message an invitation to come and seek. An invitation to come and seek, that's the title. An invitation to come and seek. Now I'll give you a bit of a structure. So you can have a look on there. We're in Isaiah 55, on the other side of the page. But just so you can see where we're going. We've got, I've split into three sections. So I've split into come, seek, go. I've tried to simplify it. Einstein said, if you can't explain something simply enough, you don't understand it. Yes. Sometimes we're going to simplify something really complicated and make it simple and applicable for our lives. That's what the plan is. So come, seek, and go. Now I've split into three sections. So the first bit is God's invitation. We just sang that song about we come only because by grace. And that's what the first bit of the message is all about. It's amazing. God's invitation to come. And we're going to see who's invited, what's offered, and what cost there is. Mm-hmm. Then we're going to see God's command for us to seek. For us to seek God where he may be found. To forsake our ways. And for God to see how he's an amazing, forgiven, lavish God. Mm-hmm. And then lastly, we're going to see God's provision. So after we come, we're going to go. And after we seek, we go. And we're going to see how about the power of God's word. How it's like the rain and the snow. And how we're going to go with joy. And how we're going to see how the curse is revealed. That's a bit of a structure for where we're going. But first, if you flick over to Isaiah 55, you can follow through. An invitation to come and see. I've got a little story to start off with. I don't know if anyone's ever heard of the uh, author Hans Christian Andersen. Yeah, everyone heard of Hans Christian Andersen? Well, there's a story in 1845, and there was a story called The Little Match Girl. I don't know if anyone's heard this story, The Little Match Girl. So what happened was, there was a young girl, and she would sell matches. Now, it was New Year's Eve, and she was in a big city, and it was freezing cold. It was dark, it was cold, it was wet, and she had a job to go and sell these little matches. So she went out into the night on New Year's Eve, and as she was going through the streets, she walked past all these houses, which had big feasts. Inside, people were celebrating. They had these banquets. It was all warm inside. There was food, there was wine. She was outside in the cold and the dark. She was walking through with her matches. And she needed to go and sell these matches because her father, he was a harsh father. And she could not go back home without selling these matches. She had to sell them. But as she was going through, everyone was in their houses, eating the feast, enjoying the banquet. And she was so cold and it was so dark. So she went to a little alleyway and she lit a little match. And she was there hovering around the match because it was so cold. And she was imagining what it was like to be in those rooms. Imagine what it was like to be in that feast. Imagine what it was like to be in that banquet. And it was dark and it was cold. And the sad bit of the story is, is that that girl died. And she died out in the cold and out in the dark. And that was a very tragic story, but it gives a little bit of a context to Isaiah 55. Because in Isaiah 55, God is extended an urgent invitation for people all around the world to come to Christ at the feast. For all people to come and to feast on Christ. And the question is, are we ended and who will we invite? Because outside of the kingdom of God, there's only darkness, misery and suffering. But inside the kingdom, there is lavish and lavish feast of blessing. And that's what we're going to have a look at today. If you have a look at verses 1 and 2, it's all about God's free grace. He says, come, all who are thirsty, come to the waters. And you who have no money, come buy and eat. Come buy wine and milk without money and without cost. So it's an invitation to come and see. The banquet is spread and all that is left is for the guests to come. It's set and we're told to come and feast on this. Now there's a bit of a context before this. Isaiah 55 is this invitation to feast. But if you read about Isaiah 53, you have to read Isaiah 55 in light of Isaiah 53. If anyone knows Isaiah 53, it's a very famous portion of scripture. It's basically all about the promised Messiah who's going to come in the future and is going to do something. Now this was written 740 years before Jesus came. So it was a prophecy about what the Messiah would do. And if you read that, it is clear that it was Jesus. I'm just going to read verse 4 to 6. It says this in Isaiah 53. Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering. Yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our sins. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him. And by his wounds we are healed. We all like sheep have gone astray. 
Each of us do our own way, but God has laid on him the servant that was promised. Him on Jesus. We know he was the one who was filled perfectly, Isaiah 53, the iniquity of us all. So we have to read Isaiah 55 in light of that. See, Jesus' ultimate sacrifice means that we have this amazing feast that all can come. And we must read this in light of Isaiah 53. Now, if, if you have a look at verse 1, it says, God invites you to come and to get something for no cost. What does that mean? It's really simple. It's free. The blessing of God is free. It's free to all. And the invitation, who is it for? It's for two people. The first person, first group of people, are like that little girl. Those who have nothing, have no money. Those who are thirsty and have nothing, they're invited to come. But also, those who are invited to come are people who do have resources. In verse 2, those who foolishly squander them are things that do not satisfy. And I think we can relate a lot more to verse 2. It says, why spend money on what is not bread? And your labour, what does not satisfy? Even those who have resources, so us in the West, we do have a lot of material things, but we're still invited to come and feast at the table. And what is being offered? So there's three things I've picked out from verse 1 and 2. We've got water, milk, and wine. So you can see verse 1 and verse, uh, and verse 2. Water, milk, and wine. So they can represent different things. So water, for example, Jesus said, I am the water of Life. Whoever comes to me will never be thirsty. Or what else is offered? Milk is offered. Often in 1 Peter, it talks about how you can grow like a small baby with milk. And that's the thing that can nourish you to go from spiritually like a baby to grow to a spiritual adult, to be mature. That's nourishment that's being offered. For us to come and receive water and to come and receive milk and also to receive wine which can represent joy. That's what's being offered. So life, nourishment, and joy is what is offered to all of us to come and experience those things. Life, real life, real nourishment, and real joy. And Jesus reasons with us. He begs us in verse 2, stop wasting your time and life on things that don't satisfy. Come in and feast at the banquet. Come and be satisfied on real life, real nourishment, and real joy. And verse 2 says, why spend money on labour that does not satisfy? Now that's a challenge for all of us. If you look at our culture, culture just says, keep buying more things, more clothes, to impress people that don't even like you with money that you don't even have. It's so messed up, our culture. It says in verse 2, why do we do that? It doesn't satisfy we're buying things that we don't need. We've got so many clothes, so many things, a bigger house, a bigger car. Yeah. Why? Why? To impress people so people can fake like things on social media mm. on things that we don't even have. Buy now, pay later. Mm. How much things we have on credit all the time. That's our culture. And the Bible says clearly those things, they don't really satisfy. Yes. If we follow the ways of the world, it will lead in destruction. The ways of the world, it only leads to death. And the question is, why? Why, why do we do that? Because those things don't really satisfy. If I got all of us individually to stand up and say, before you met with Christ, what things did you run after? I guarantee if we went through everyone, there would be so many different things. Maybe we have things like, I used to run after money or power, maybe wealth or fame, popularity. For some of us, it may have been uh, women or men in a wrong relationship. I know that was what it was like for me. Uh, chasing after things like alcohol or drugs, mm -hmm. pleasure, things like position, thrill, mm -hmm. popularity, these things. Maybe we all used to run after those things. And the challenge is for all of us is to remember that those things still don't satisfy. Mm -hmm. It's not like when we're born again believers, those things, the temptation of the world, they don't go away. They do. Mm -hmm. They're always still there because culture is so loud. Yeah. And we need to remember what Ecclesiastes says. That everything is meaningless. There's nothing under the sun that is new. It's all like chasing the wind. It's meaningless. But culture is very, very loud. And have a look in verse 2b. It says, listen. Listen to me. And eat what is good. And you will delight in the riches of a fair. Give ear and come to me. Listen. That you may live. Three times it says listen. 
God says, listen to me. Listen. When the world is so loud, yes. listen yes. to me. Listen to the strongest voice, not the loudest voice of culture, but listen. And the question is this morning, it's really simple. Are we listening? Are we really listening? It says in Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 3, it says, Listening will make it possible to stay alive. Listening will make it possible to stay alive. Are we listening to the word or are we listening to the world? Because there's many voices. You've got YouTubers. Have you listened to YouTube? I know Manuel you probably does. But you've got YouTubers. You have podcasts. You have newspapers. You have Amazon Audible books. We have uh, social media. Celebrities. All these things. Reality TV. Are we listening to those things? Or are we listening to the word of God? Because it says, God says, if we come, if we come to him and eat what is good, we will delight in the riches of the fair. We will delight in food that really satisfies the soul. Really satisfies. Things in the world cannot satisfy, but this will, if we come and have that water, nourishment, and joy, that really will satisfy. And I've got a little phrase that stays today. I know about the phrase that stays. It says that intimacy produces boldness. Intimacy with God, coming to God, having intimacy with Him, gives us boldness to live counterculturally in a world. The world says do all this stuff, but when we have intimacy with God, that is the secret, that is His strength. When you know Him deeply, you can live counterculturally and not bow down to the things of the world and don't dance to the beat of the drum of the world. But it's intimacy that produces boldness. Come in to God. Give ear to me, God says. Give ear to me and listen. Not just on a Sunday. This is every single day. Every single day. And I've got a little principle called the 165 principle. There's 168 hours in the week, 24 times 7, 168. And the 165 principle is if you're not in church, say we're in church for two hours and then traveling for an hour, that's three hours. That means we have 165 other hours in the week. And the question is, how are you going to come to God each and every single day? Now, I know what some of you might be thinking. I said this to a guy at college, and he said, well, I'm sleeping for a lot of those. <laughs> That's fine. So if you're sleeping for 60, you've still got 100. But the point is, the 165 principle, how are you coming to God daily? What does that look like for you daily? Not just on a Sunday to be satisfied with food for the soul. It's how you meet with God in the Word. Maybe some of us need to get a good Bible reading series or to be watching a series online or get the version app so we can daily come to God. Daily come and listen to Him every single day and have fellowship with Him in prayer through the Word of God. The 165 principle. What does that look like for us every single day? Now verses 3 to 5 goes on to say this. I will make an everlasting covenant with you. My faithful love promised to David, see, I have made him a witness to the peoples, a ruler and commander of the peoples. Surely you will summon nations you do not know, and nations will come to know you, uh, will come running to you, because of the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, for he has endowed you with splendor. So verses 3 to 5 identifies the basis of this rich invitation to come and see. And it's the covenant blessings that were promised to David. Now in the book of Isaiah, I'm studying it at college, got an exam on it, that's why I've been looking at it a lot. Between chapters 1 to 39, there's many mentions of David. So it's, there's a promise that says, from David's line, the Messiah is going to come, and he's going to fulfill everything uh, that is promised. But this is the only reference after uh, chapter 40 about King David, which is quite interesting. And so, we have this figure called the servant. So chapters 40 to 55 is a bit of a section of Isaiah. And there's a figure called the servant. And so we read in Isaiah 53, this is what the servant is going to achieve. All the way through 40 to 55. The servant, who's described in royal terms, is going to do certain things. But really interesting, at the end of 54, verse 17, just before this, is a very famous verse. I know lots of you all know it. It says, every weapon formed against you will not prosper. And every tongue that rises against you, you shall refute. And it says, this is interesting, it says, this is the heritage of the servants. 
So this is the first time where it flips on the servants to the servants. So chapter 40 to 55 is all about the servant. And then obviously we know that that's Jesus. What he's going to do. Okay, all prophesy. But at the end of 54, it says this, this is the heritage of the servants. So now it's flipping to everyone. Amen. All Amen. of us now in 55 get to get the promises of David. We get to have the righteousness of the servant. And it's all because of grace. Amen. It says that in verses 1 to 4, anyone who can fulfill the conditions of 1 to 2, verses 1 to 2, basically anyone who's really hungry and really thirsty, anyone who's going to come and receive this free stuff, anyone who does that, they can participate in this amazing covenant. How amazing is that in all these promises? We can have those royal Davidic privileges. If we come to God, how amazing is that? God will treat us as royal sons and daughters. We're going to have royal status and royal privileges just by coming to God. How amazing is that? By being super hungry and super thirsty. That's it. Wow. It's amazing. And we see that in verses 3 to 5, there's going to be an everlasting covenant. An everlasting covenant There's going to be a sign. Because you look at the Bible and then with covenants, there's always a sign. God's promise. So you look with Noah, there was the rainbow as the sign. We look with Abraham, there was circumcision was the sign. We look with Moses, the covenant there was the sprinkling of blood was the sign. And now we're going to see in this everlasting sign is there's going to be someone from the throne of David that's going to have an everlasting throne and an everlasting kingdom. Amen. And we know that in Jesus. Yes. The final covenant between God will fulfill all of those other covenants perfectly. It will fulfill them. It won't just make them known for you. It will fulfill all of those other covenants in the Bible. And uh, all the promises of God are going to be yet and amen. amen. And we know that's all in Christ. But have a look at verses 4 to 5. In verses 4 to 5, it's closely linked together. It says that God made David a witness to those around him. He was a leader. And now he's going to make Israel, the servants, the leader, the witness to these people. He said that he's going to do the same with Israel as he did with David. They're not going to conquer physically, but they're going to conquer spiritually because of what God does in their midst. Israel and the servants... They're going to be like a magnet Amen. attracting people Amen. into God's kingdom. Amen. And that's like all of us. We, when we come to God, we'll become like a magnet for those to come into God's kingdom, to come and enjoy that feast and that banquet. In verse 4 mentions being a witness. When we come to God, we become a witness. In, in Isaiah 43, a bit earlier in the chapter, in the book, um, it talks about how the, the people of God... They're blind. They're blind. But they're still going to be used by God to make other people see. see yes. Even though themselves are blind, they're going to be used for other people to, so they can see. And that's all because of God's grace. And that's the same with us, even though we, with our sin, we mess up. But still, we come to God. He still wants to use us yes. to be a magnet yes. to other people yes. and for, uh, for us to be a witness to those around us. And we can experience those divine privileges. But what this is saying in, in verses 3 to 5, it's saying, look, everyone who is a moral failure, everyone, you and me, that's a messed up failure, you can come and mess up and be treated like the King David. Yes. You can be yeah. treated like a royal son and daughter. Isn't that amazing? Yes. Oh, we have that. That is great. Yes. Like we sang today, it's only through his grace that we have that. Yes. And what's the result in verse 5? Have a look. Verse 5, it talks about that the nations, the conversion of the nations, the conversion of the Gentiles through this new covenant initiated through the servant, Jesus. Now we live in this time where all nations are going to come to him. And we talk about revival. Revival starts when we come to God. Yes. We always pray God send revival. I already quote by a guy called uh, Martin Lloyd Jones, famous preacher. He said, Revival first starts with the people of God, yes. and then it affects yes. the people who are outside. Yes. It has to start with us. Yes. We're yes. praying, God, <coughs> send revival, yes. send your Holy Spirit. But we need to come to God ourselves, yes. set ourselves on fire for God, 
And then the world yes. will see. Then will be a magnet. Then will be a witness. Then the nation's going to come. Yes. The nations yes. are here in this country. They're here on the streets, yes. the high street. Yes. They're here. Mm-hmm. And this country, and the UK needs this. Mm-hmm. For us to have that, to be much like him, we have to be much with him. Yes. One of our last yes. mentors said that to me when I first became a Christian. To be much like him, to be much like Jesus, you have to be much with him. Yes. And that requires sacrifice to come every day. Come. Because remember, intimacy produces boldness. Intimacy with God produces boldness. Real intimacy with him. I'm not talking about intimacy with another human being. In the past, maybe some of us have went to intimacy with a, with a human relationship. That was my story. God wants us to go and have real intimacy with him yes. to produce boldness. Because intimacy with the wrong human will produce shame. Yes. But intimacy with him will produce boldness and live for him. Amen. 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 So he will, will make us a witness. And he will make us a leader. And the nations will come. But that's the secret of revival. What's the secret of revival? It's coming to God daily. Amen. The second section is all about seek. seek. Verses 6 to 9 is about seek. Verse 6 to 9 says this. Seek the Lord. While he may be found, call on him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake their ways and the unrighteous their thoughts. Let them turn to the Lord and he will have mercy on them. And to our God, for he will freely pardon. Seek the Lord. There's this thing about urgency. This, this real urgency that the reality is there's many people who are in the dark, in the cold, who have not had the invitation to come to Christ. And the reality is like I was reminded by some of my family members who died last week and are on the verge of death, that death will come without the invitation. All Christ will return. There's a real urgency to seek God. A real urgency. Last weekend I went to John Wesley's house uh, in Old Street in London. I thoroughly recommend you go. It was a fantastic experience. I've got a little uh, card here that I went. And uh, I went to learn all about John Wesley. And he was someone that would go and seek the Lord. I, I went into his room and I knelt down where he used to kneel and he used to pray at four o'clock in the morning for an hour with God. He'd meet with God. He was serious about seeking God. And the reason why he did that, the story behind it, is because when he went on a mission trip, he went with his brother Charles who wrote thousands of hymns. He went over to Central America, I think it was, and went on a mission trip. It was a bit of a failure of a mission trip. And he came back and he was on a boat with the Moravians. And the ship, it was like, it was, it was, they thought he was going to sink. And it was really bad, the conditions. And you know what happened was, the Moravians who he was with, the people he was with, they had a real and genuine faith. They were seeking God, even in the midst of this chaos. And he, he at that time, was the time where he got serious with God. Because he saw them had a real serious and genuine faith. And he said, I'm not really taking this seriously. I'm not really seeking God like these people are seeking. I have a similar story. When I went to Malawi for the first time, I was blown away. Those people have real, genuine, sincere faith. And that challenged me to say, can I seek God, really, to be serious about faith, and to really seek God every day. And like John Wesley, he, he, saw, he went for that four to five, but he was a guy who did that, that worked for him. Now his movement was obviously Methodism, which he didn't really want to create a denomination or movement. But people, they made a denomination out of it, and tried to do it the way that he did it. But I think we need to find our own way of seeking God. Yes. It's not just seek God like that. It doesn't mean you have to wake up at 4 o'clock. Some of us do night shifts, we're going to say. <laughs> it's hard, we're tired. But the thing is, is yeah. what does it look like for us to seek God every day? Real and genuine. Not just because like a man of God did that, that way. But what does it look like for you in your life? Yeah. When you're working shifts, when you have a busy family life, when you're juggling kids, when you're juggling all that stuff. What does it look like to seek God daily? And really seek that intimacy with God. That's a challenge and an urgency for me and for the UK. To be serious and seek God. Amen. To really seek Amen. Him. Verse 7. Let the wicked forsake their ways. This is all about repentance. All about repentance. Amen. Ch- turning the other way. Repentance is just turning the other way. Turning the other way. Why? Because God is a God of mercy. You know those things that we seek of the world which don't satisfy Turn away from those things. Repent of those things Amen. and say, God, I need your help. And you know what the amazing thing is uh, in, ver- in verse 7 uh, at the end? talks about how God is a God of mercy. Now he will freely pardon. 
Amen. We always explain in sports ministries, we deserve the red card for our sin, what we mess up doing. But in his mercy, God does not give us what we deserve. He doesn't give us that red card. No. Jesus took that red card for us. Yes. Amen? Yes. He doesn't give us what we have. And we have that amazing promise to give the world. In verse 7, amazing promise. That if you turn away from your sin, God will freely pardon. Amen. Now, in the context of uh, Isaiah 55, remember that there would have been an exile at the, through the Babylonians at this point. So they've been reading this. And they may have been thinking, God, are you stingy? Are you hard-hearted? After going into exile, they may have thought that. But it's not true. God is a God of forgiveness yes. and of love. Yes. And in the parable of the talents, remember there was somebody who got five, three, and one. Yeah. The, the one who got one, do you remember what he said about the master? He said, I thought that you, the master, representing God, was a master that was hard-hearted. But it wasn't true. It's not true. God is a God of lavish grace. A God of forgiveness and of love. All the way through Isaiah, all the way through the Old Testament, I'm passionate about telling Christians this, that God is a God of mercy in the Old Testament. He's a God of grace. And in the context, you would see that, but they'll be thinking, wow God, you are far more gracious than I could ever possibly imagine. Have a look at verse 8 and 9. It says this, For my thoughts, God is saying, are not your thoughts, Neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As high as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. So you can have a look. So, in this context, remember that the people would be thinking, wow, this is amazing because God, you are far more gracious than I ever possibly imagined. And they were, just like us, encouraged to take advantage of the servant's death in Isaiah 53, to come to him, forsake our ways, because with God, where sin abounds, grace abounds the more. Where sin increases, God's grace abounds, and his ways are higher. And all of us, all of this must be so hard to grasp that God, this is like a fantasy dream, that God is far more gracious and loving than we can ever possibly imagine by coming to seek God. Now, if you think about the power of the human mind, I wonder if you've got any stories about what's the most amazing story about the power of the human mind. I've got a, a story that I think is pretty impressive. In 1947, there was an Argentinian chess player, 1947, and he played blindfolded. <laughs> he played blindfolded, let me check this out, for 45 games in a row. So by memory, the guy who was playing chess, 47, uh, 45 five times in a row. So he was playing his opponent, didn't even see the board. Imagine how powerful the human mind is. I was like, wow, that's pretty powerful. But let me tell you something. That God today controls the lives of over 7 billion people. So compared to the human mind, God is way higher than we can ever possibly imagine. His ways are higher, his thoughts are higher. And uh, it's crazy to understand. Now, it's a bit of a news flash for all of us. We in our lives will never fully understand everything. We will never, in our human mind, never fully understand God's grace, God's mercy, and the things that we go through in our life. Because God is the creator, and we are the creature. He's not a creature, he's a creator being, he created us. Therefore, he is different. And all the way through Isaiah, God has reminded his people that he's not like them. He's not like them. His ways are higher, his thoughts are higher. We're not going to ex- understand everything. Now, I know, as Pentecostals will say, those who have the Spirit will understand things in the Spirit, which is true. We will understand those things more than someone who isn't a believer and isn't, uh, isn't born again. Yes. But there's still things that we will not understand and fully figure out in our life. Because he's higher, his ways are higher, his thoughts are higher. Yes. Yeah. Now, I'm not going to read it, but in Psalm 73, the psalmist talks about this. Maybe you want to go home and read this in Psalm 73. And he was thinking, how do I figure out this stuff? And what he said was, when I was trying to figure out this, the thoughts were oppressive. Yes. If you try and figure out stuff in your life when things go wrong, when yes. things aren't going right, it becomes oppressive. Yes. And the psalmist in Psalm 73 said this, look, I looked at my neighbour, he said, neighbour, this neighbour, he curses God. This neighbour, he does what he wants in his own eyes. And I praise God. I worship him. I'm the one who does that. Yet, neighbour, he's not a child of God. He's living his own way. He's doing his own thing. Me, 
I'm a child of the living God. But it looks like neighbor is thriving. It, it looks like neighbor is doing well. Why is neighbor doing so well? And for me, things are hard. Things are tough. Yeah, I'm praising. I'm doing all this stuff. And he says to Psalm, he Psalm 73, he said, this became oppressive. I didn't understand this stuff. And it was weighing me down. But it says in Psalm 73, he says this, but I ended the sanctuary of God. Yes. But I entered the sanctuary of God when I saw God, when I started to seek God. I ended the presence. When I started seeking God, I ended into Him. Then I understood. He said that neighbor, when neighbor dies, all the things that neighbor lived for will pass away. Pass away. And it will be nothing. nothing. It will be absolutely nothing. Yeah. And the things that I live for, God will take me by the right hand Amen. and he will lead me Amen. into paradise, yes. into glory, and live with him forever Amen. in eternity, Amen. in heaven. Amen. That's when he understood things. When did he understand things? Yes. When he entered the sanctuary. <laughs> when he Amen. started seeking God. When he entered into that place, into the presence, then he understood. And those things weren't oppressive anymore. He had the heavenly perspective. He didn't understand everything, but he had more of God's perspective. I've got a little quote. I uh, listened to a guy called Mark Ritchie, very famous Christian comedian, really funny guy. He's got a great podcast called Soul Focus. It's good if you want to download it. And uh, he talks about we can, we can either magnify God or magnify our problem. You can magnify God or magnify your problem. You can seek God and magnify him, or you can be oppressive and question everything, and you're going to magnify your problems, you're going to get bigger and bigger and bigger. It's a little bit like when you're on a plane. When you're on a plane, when you just start to take off all the buildings, are nice and big, and you take it off from Heathrow or Gatwick, the more Heathrow, the buildings are big, but when you start going up, up and up and up and up, they get smaller and smaller and smaller. And that's what it's like when you see God. Amen. At the end of the sanctuary, at the end of his presence, yes. the things that you struggle with, your problems, they get smaller. They don't go away, but they get smaller because you magnify God, yes. not magnify your problem. When you magnify your problem, it looks huge and big. The giants look big, but when you get the perspective of the giant killer, it changes everything. Yes. And that's a challenge for all of us. Yes. Are you going to magnify God or magnify your problem? Because yes. his yes. thoughts are not our thoughts, and his ways are not our ways. Declares the Lord. Amen. We have to seek God and magnify Him because remember, intimacy produces boldness. Yes. To face our problems and to face our difficulties. Intimacy produces boldness. <laughs> then we go on verse 10 to 13. This little section I've called Go. To have this utter joy, and we see the recreation of nature, and we're going to see this promise of a return from exile one day for those who were uh, readers at the time. Verse 10, it says, As the rain and the snow come down from heaven, and do not return to it without water in the earth, and making it bud and flourish, so that it yields uh, seed for the sower and bread for the eater, so it is for my word that goes out from my mouth. It will not return to me empty, but will accomplish what I desire, and accomplish the purpose for which I, God, send it. You will go out in joy and be led forth in peace. The mountains and hills will burst in song before you and the trees of the field will clap their hands. And instead of the thorn bush, will grow the juniper. So this is an amazing blossoming uh, tree. And instead of the briar, so it's a little uh, thorny bush. Instead of the thorny bush, you can have the myrtle, which is a tree which heals. And this will be the Lord's renown, an everlasting sign that will endure forever. And this is the end of this amazing chapter. So we see the final section highlights the power of God's word. Yes. Being like water and snow that comes down from heaven. And we see it, it brings instruction, promises and warnings. But it's going to produce transformation for sinners like you and me. And as the word goes out, so we go out. Yes. We come, we seek and then we go. And God is continuing this lavish invitation to the feast. And it's all communicated through his word. And he compares his word to being like rain and snow that fall from heaven. And become, the word comes down and it waters the earth and it makes things grow. It makes things grow and blossom. And that's the same when God sends out his word yes. in the power of the Holy Spirit. Yes. Things start yes. to grow. Yes. 
and things start to change and things get to start to transform around us. And verse 11, this is often misquoted. So have a look um, at what the, who the focus of the verse is about. You may have heard this before. So my word, God's word, it goes out of my mouth and it will not return empty. We always say that God's word will never return empty. But look at who's the focus. But will accomplish what I desire. Not what we desire, but what God Desires. will desire. And achieve the purpose for which I said God saying this. What God achieves and what God wants. That's the focus of that verse. Sometimes when we go, sometimes they maybe preach on the streets. You've seen fervent street preachers. They're always asking for maybe God to do what they want it to achieve. But it's always what God wants it to achieve and His purposes. And that just really highlights to me the need to pray. You know, we read the parable of the sower. The word sometimes falls on good ground, good soil. Sometimes falls on the bad soil. Sometimes the weeds chokes it. Sometimes the birds come and take the seed, which represents the word of God. And that just highlighted to me the importance of when we go, of really praying. So when we go and share with our friends who don't know God, those who don't know our family members particularly, to pray, to really pray fervently and for God to achieve what He desires and for what He purposes it to do. Amen? Amen. But uh, we need to be led by the Spirit and share God's Amen. Word to achieve His purposes Amen. and what He desires. Amen. Amen. Amen? Verse 12, I love it. So after we come and after we seek, we're going to go. We go and be a witness. We go and let the nations come to us. And we go. What do we go with? We go out with joy. We go out with joy. Because we are feasting on the things that really satisfy. We're feasting on the water, on the milk, on the uh, wine, the life, the nourishment, and the, the joy. We really feast on that stuff so we can go. We go with joy. And we're led forth by peace. peace. We're not led forth by fear. No. We're led forth by peace. Amen. We're led forth Amen. by the Holy Spirit. We're led forth Amen. by the Prince of Peace. We go with those things. But the reason why we go is because we first respond to verse 1 and 2, which is simply to come. The two things that we require is just to come and to seek. That's it, to come and seek God. You know, Jesus started church with sinners. He started a church with those who were fancy rabbis. He started those yeah. who were fishermen, who was a, a zealot, kind of like a terrorist. Yes. Someone who started yeah. like tax collecting, robbed people of money. Yeah. You know, he started, it's like yeah. starting a university with dropouts. Yeah. It's like starting a business with those who have got a clue who go bankrupt. That's what happens. Jesus calls you and me to come and receive that offer of free grace and to come and seek. You don't need to be this amazing person who has it all together. It's just simply to come and to see. That's it. They're the only conditions. You don't need to have gone to a Bible college. You don't need to have gone to anything. To go to the Holy Land, God of Israel. You don't need to have done all those things. The only requirements are verse 1 and 2. For every ordinary, yes. necessary, broken person is to come and to yes. see God. Amen. And Isaiah 55 is speaking for all of us to go out. Not just missionaries. Not just pastors. No. This is for all. In your sphere, wherever you are, in your workplace, your friends, your family, wherever you are, your sports teams, your hobbies, whatever that is, it's for you and me to go out with that joy and that peace. That's all it is. It's nothing fancy. We go out, and the other end we see in this is that there will be an everlasting sign that we know one day there will be a new heaven Amen. and a new earth. Amen. And the best way to describe uh, the, what's happened at the end of, is that, that the curse is reversed. Yes. You see that the curse is reversed. The curse that came from Adam is reversed through Jesus. And instead of a thorn bush, we're going to have these amazing trees that are going to grow. Yes. And instead of the uh, scraggly little thorn bushes, we're going to have this tree of healing. That's what's going to happen. And that's going to be the sign. The enduring sign that will endure forever. Yes. That's all we have to go out with knowing that. At the end of the day, God's lasting commitment and compassion have the final say and have the final word. Yes. And that's it. Come, seek, and go. If you have a look on the back of your uh, page, you can see I've put a few uh, application things. So you see at the front I've got the structure, and then I've got a few of the notes. But the application... So remember I said, in light of Isaiah 53, clearly, um, this talks about the substitutionary work of Jesus 
the sinners, and calls in Isaiah 55, everyone, all sinners, from every nation, from every tribe, and every tongue, yeah. to forsake their sin, and come and feast on the grace, and come and feast on the forgiveness that are inside the kingdom of God. That's for everyone to come. Remember I said about the 165 principle? How are you coming to God? 165 hours where you're not changed. How are you coming to experience that water and the milk and the wine that represents life, nourishment, joy? The real things that satisfies. And I put the real challenge for us, for me, is to not be glutting ourselves, indulging on materialism and the things of the world yes. that don't satisfy. Yes. And let your soul be truly satisfied. Mm -hmm. Delighted. Remember, that's the promise. Your soul can be delighted on the food that really satisfies. The question is, are we really listening to the word or the will? Is the Bible on the shelf at home? The Bible which is full of the self-help? Or are we leaving that alone and looking at the TV and social media all the time? <laughs> Seek God. Are we seeking God urgently? What does that look like for you, like John Wesley did? How do we seek God? Fervently, urgently, every day. Forsaking our evil ways, what does that look like for you? What does that look like? Now, in college, we did this module on addiction. So we talked about what if, if those who even are believers are caught up in addiction, what voice do you listen to? Now I sat in this seminar and it was quite interesting because he said, imagine you've got two voices, you've got the good voice and the bad voice. Now he said, don't just think you're listening to the small bad voice. It's not that simple. And this is what really got me. He said, the problem is when you're addicted to something, when you go to something in the world, is that you're actually agreeing and listening to your own voice. It's not as easy as just the little voice on the shoulder, the good voice and the bad voice. It's actually that you, your own voice, has convinced yourself that this is the thing to take, the thing of the world that's satisfying. Now, if that is the problem, then that means that you are not the answer. It means that God is the answer and the solution. Because often the word will say, look to yourself. You have in yourself what it is to overcome addiction, whatever it is you're addicted to. But actually, you are not the answer to your own problem. It is God coming to him and seeking him, to have that real intimacy with him that produces that boldness. That was a real scary kind of revelation to me. It's not those little voices, it's your own voice. And therefore, God is the solution. Coming to him and seeking him and having that intimacy is the real solution. To seek his perspective, especially when we don't understand things. Remember, end of that sanctuary, like Psalm 73 said, give that a read when you go home. Magnify God, not magnify your problems. Amen. How do you do that on a daily basis? And the last one, we go. Why do we go? We go because we know. We go because we know. Yes. We go because the curse is reversed. Yes. We go with joy. Amen. And we go being led forth with peace. Amen. We go because we know that the curse has been reversed. Yes. Hallelujah. Amen. I don't know what that looks like for you. I think we're going to spend a bit of time maybe praying in twos and threes and sharing a few things because we've got a bit of time. What things, what does that look like for you practically? To come, to seek, and to go. That invitation to come and seek. I'll pray, and then we'll spend time praying in small groups, twos and threes, before we finish. Go, let's pray.